Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar uh, featuring Will Dowling and Eric Taylor here from Circle App. As a quick reminder, this report, this webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be made available to all registrants. All participants will remain muted, but please feel free to submit questions through GoToWebinar. We'll have a section at the end for the team to answer questions that come in live and those that have been submitted ahead of time. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Alex Kearns, and I am our community manager here at Circle Up. As you all know, we're here today to discuss Helio, our machine learning platform. I'm thrilled to introduce two of my colleagues, Eric Taylor, who's a senior data scientist, and Will Dowling, research manager, to you all. Eric is a senior data scientist at CircleUp. His jobs are to build new models, evaluate new data sets, and share insights from Helio with the other teams at CircleUp and the broader community. Before joining CircleUp, he worked in aviation and cloud computing and holds a PhD in cognitive psychology from the University of Illinois, as well as a BA in mathematics from the University of Texas. Will is currently our research manager here at Circle Up, where he analyzes and writes about trends in the consumer sector. Previously, he worked in research for the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. He holds his bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland and his master's in public policy from the University of Oxford. We are very excited to introduce Helio to you all. On that note, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Will. All right. Thanks, Alex, for the introductions, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today for what I hope will be an interesting and engaging conversation. Here at Circle Up, we talk about our machine learning platform, Helio, a lot. Um, it comes up in almost every business conversation we have internally, and over the past six months, we've been able to share a lot of insights gathered through Helio externally as well. But we realized recently that we haven't really had an opportunity to have a detailed conversation with all of you about Helio, to explain what it is, why we built it, and share some insights that it's helped us gather. That's why Eric and I are so excited to be hosting this webinar, to share with all of you what we find so interesting and exciting about Helio. One thing I want to say from the beginning is that we really hope this will be more of a conversation than a presentation. Um, Eric and I have some slides we want to go through in the uh, first half of the webinar to set some context, but we want to take the second half of today to go through questions you may have about Helio and the types of data that it helps us access. Uh, if there's enough interest, we'd love to host additional webinars on this topic down the road. So as we go through the discussion today, think about the kinds of questions you'd have for us in Helio and send them Alex's, Alex's way so that we can uh, get to them in the second half. Now, previously I worked in research for the government, um, so I'm used to giving long, boring disclaimers before presentations. Uh, I'm going to save you all the grief today and instead give a short, boring disclaimer. Uh, firstly, the data and analysis we're going to share with you today is based on work that Eric and I have done. Our viewpoints don't necessarily reflect the viewpoints of CircleUp as a company. Um, secondly, we're going to talk about Helio as openly as we can, but there are certain aspects that we won't be able to share for privacy reasons, so if these come up, um, we'll just let you know. If we go to the next slide here. Uh, one more slide ahead, actually. Okay, so now that that's out of the way, and before we get into the technical details of Helio, I want to spend just a moment talking about how we arrived at the name. This is sort of nerdy, but I think it's kind of cool, too. Um, in Greek mythology, Helios is the Greek god who is the personification of the sun. This is slightly different than Apollo. Helios shines a light on the earth to illuminate what's happening there. As you'll hear in today's talk, our machine learning platform kind of lets us shine a light on the consumer sector. Uh, so that's why we thought Helio would be a fitting name. All right, enough about Greek mythology. On that note, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Eric, who's going to get into more of the technical details of how and why we built Helio. All right, thanks, Will. I'd like to spend a few minutes discussing what Helio is today and then where we'd like to progress in 2018 and beyond. As we mentioned, Helio is Circle of Proprietary <laughs> Machine Learning Platform for sourcing and evaluating early stage consumer brands in North America. Helio is composed of data and then models that sit on top of the data. To give you some rough numbers, we track about 1.2 million brands across over 200 or so data sources. The data itself can be broken down into three groups, which are public, private, and then circle up data. Public data is just that, data that can be accessed you know, from the public domain by anyone who's willing to devote substantial resources into collecting and organizing it. 
um, private data is data that we acquire either via partnerships or through purchase. And then circle of data is data that we collect and protect from our brands, including companies that apply to our marketplace or for a loan, and then just generally companies we build relationships with. All of this data is structured in a way that's easily ingestible by our ever increasing number of models or algorithms. We have different types of models, right? Some enable us to predict useful things like revenue and revenue growth for an arbitrary brand, whereas others help us to evaluate key dimensions of a CPG company like brand strength or product differentiation, team, and distribution breadth and quality. We even have a model that accesses the exit potential for a given company. And on the next slide, I'll show you um, basically the way this all, all comes together is at first we compile and maintain this list of companies, that 1.2 million I mentioned earlier, which is always being refreshed and growing. Um, and then we collect data from these companies across a set of predefined sources. Then we run these data through our proprietary algorithms. And lastly, we utilize the results from the algorithms to test hypotheses and solve specific business problems, right? So, for example, when performing diligence on a brand for the marketplace or for the fund, or evaluating a company for a loan. On the next slide, you'll see our, our vision for Helio is, is basically to progress through these stages depicted in Gartner's data sophistication journey. Essentially, the journey starts at the bottom left of the graph, advancing from the ability to merely describe what happened to then being able to explain post hoc why something might have happened to then building models that can actually predict future events, such as whether a company might have breakout success. Um, and then finally, and this is key, arrive at the ability to prescribe change. So at the top right of that, uh, in that box, the prescriptive box, that's our ultimate goal for Helio, which is to leverage Helio to prescribe changes to a company's strategy that will produce a desired outcome, such as revenue growth. In other words, not only do we want to predict whether a given company is likely to succeed, we actually want to have a strong enough understanding of the mechanics of an industry and of a specific set of brands that we can leverage our data to make helpful suggestions. We want to help you to utilize Helio on your journey to building a successful company. All right, so next I'd like to dive into one of the models. That's the lay of the land, how Helio looks today, um, I'm actually going to share some demos from one of our newest models, the product packaging model, and then I'll hand the baton over to Will for a discussion of some provocative industry analyses. So let's talk about packaging. They say you eat with your eyes first, right? And I, I think that's probably intended for a restaurant experience or when you're sitting in front of a plate of food. It applies equally when you're browsing the aisles at the supermarket, right? Here's a package of yogurt. So we see a collection of different features and properties, including brand logo, text, describing some nutritional data, uh, a sample of the types of food inside, but we also get a kind of gestalt work of art, right? The package is pleasing, it's attractive to some extent. Why is that? And how do we begin to measure this? Well, one model I built recently begins to kind of chip away at these questions, breaking down each of these features into numbers which we can measure for all product packages and then perform analyses. And I'll focus in particular on the most fun aspect of this project for me, which was just analyzing the different colors. On the next slide, you'll see the first step of any analysis of visual information is to choose a useful representation. And so for color analysis, that means choosing a palette of possible colors and then saying for a given image how prominent each color is. For this analysis, I chose a 27 color palette and here are the colors from that palette that we see in the yogurt pack. The height of the bars represents a kind of score that judges both whether the color is present and then how prominent the color is in the image. Where prominence is judged in terms of things like relevancy, centrality, and then sheer volume. In other words, this graph and the numbers behind it are how we measure the color properties of the package. And now that we have these numbers for each specific package, we can do really cool, interesting stuff like on the following page. What you're seeing here is approximately 5,400 yogurt packages kind of piled on top of one another. Each package is represented by a thin horizontal slice. And I've clustered the packages so that groups with similar coloring appear together. And as you can see, um, at the top, we have a cluster 
with a mixture of kind of red and yellow and then a miscellany of different colors that you see in the middle. The next cluster down is more dominated by dark blues and magenta. And then other, other clusters have different dominant colors, right? And what you get by plotting the colors this way is an awareness of A, the various color schemes used in yogurt packages, and then B, the relative frequency of those different color schemes. So for example, that green color, um, there are a handful of packages that utilize it, but they're much less common than um, say a bunch of blue colors or a bunch of red and uh, magenta colors. On the next page, you can see that we can extract another insight from this kind of analysis, which is what is sort of like the average yogurt package. In other words, if we average the values of the bars across all the packages, what would you see, right? So the first thing I see is that white is actually the most prominent color over on the right, followed by reds and dark blues, and then what appear to be some kind of earthier colors in the middle, perhaps from images of food maybe. And then the least common colors are really bright colors like bright blue and green. So like I said, this is the average yogurt package. Once we've calculated the average, we can do all sorts of other useful things, like for example, um, one hypothesis that a few folks at Circle Up have is that more distinctive product packages tend to be associated with more successful brands. And we can easily calculate differentiation as the distance of a given package from the average. Right, so now I'll preface this by saying the jury's still definitely out on this hypothesis. I'm bringing you kind of bleeding edge helio insights here. But the point is that with this data, we're now in a great position to test that idea. And just for fun, I, I did pull out a couple of the most distinctive yogurts, and you'll see them on the, right, on the next page. Sure enough, two of the most distinctive packages have that provocative bright green color that we saw on previous slides was relatively rare. And by looking at a few examples, we can now see that these packages are sometimes associated with a lime color, or sort of flavored yogurt, a key lime flavor. And then supposing for a moment that we, we finished the analysis and decided that being distinctive was good, if that were the case, and again, we don't know, <laughs> um, we might decide, for example, to consider releasing like a new key lime flavored product uh, in the yogurt skew, or um, in the yogurt group. And, uh, or perhaps just adding a dash of bright green to an existing uh, skew. And so what's super exciting about this analysis actually is not, it's not just about yogurt or this example, we can discover the m most distinctive packages across the entire universe of CPG brands. And from there, we can perform deeper analyses to understand why products are standing out and whether certain trends or data points suggest a course of action, getting at that, at that prescriptive part of Helio. So now that we've done a deep dive into one component of our newer Helio models, this product packaging model, I'd like to hand the uh, baton off to Will, who's been doing some really interesting work with our Helio data around consumer trends and it's generally fun topics in CPG. Awesome, thanks Eric. So Eric's talked a bit about uh, what a brand says with its packaging, but it's also really important to look at what a brand says about itself through its content. Uh, with Helio, we're able to analyze uh, a brand's messaging through a number of different channels and then identify the keywords that a brand uses to describe itself. Maybe a brand talks about itself mainly as being vintage or sustainable. Here's an analysis I did where I looked at 10,000 different fashion companies to identify the keywords these companies use to describe themselves. I then compared that to each company's brand score, which is derived by looking at things like the strength, reach, growth, and intensity. As you can see, the brands that identified themselves as modern or fresh in the fashion category scored the highest on brand, um, while those that advertised themselves as luxury scored slightly below average and sustainable and handmade kind of came in uh, well below average. So when I first saw this, this caused me to scratch my head a little bit because I, I would have thought like luxury brands would do very well uh, on brand score, um, but uh, doing a little more research on this, it turns out that a lot of luxury and premium brands actually don't like to have too much of a, a uh, public image, a public brand. They don't like to put too much content out because they fear that it may sort of cheapen their prestige. Whereas more modern fashion companies take the opposite approach. They think it's really important to communicate their brand message and value through a wide array of channels on social media, on their website, um, things like that. 
Now, sustainable and handmade brands, um, a lot of these uh, companies tend to be more bespoke in their production and so don't really have the infrastructure in place to launch massive uh, communication campaigns, which kind of uh, you can see there in the chart, which is why they score a bit lower uh, on brand. So if we go to the next slide, in that same vein, here's another quick analysis I did on this subject, this time looking at the way that food brands uh, describe themselves. So it's particularly interested uh, in this and the number of brands that describe themselves as gluten-free compared to plant-based. And I did a write-up on this topic. So in this word cloud here, um, the size and the prominence of the word uh, is an indicator of how many brands use that word uh, to describe themselves on their websites uh, and things like that. Um, you can see that the number of companies describing themselves as plant-based in the lower left corner, so it's underlined in red, it's still pretty small, but I think it's significant given the uh, youth of the plant-based movement. It's still a very uh, young uh, movement that's really only come uh, gained traction over the last year or so. And that's one thing that's kind of exciting about Helio is that we're able to identify these patterns early on and identify a pattern that might eventually evolve into a trend. And that's exactly what happened here uh, with plant-based. So I did a sort of write-up piece on this, looking at the evolution of the plant-based um, movement. So if we go to the next slide here, this is on a bit of a different topic, but the way a brand talks about itself is an important signal, right? Um, but how important are the ways that consumers talk about a brand? So in a lot of cases, of course, they're really important. It, it matters a lot what consumers say about you. Uh, but in some instances, it may matter a bit less than you think. So in this analysis, I used Helio to look at product reviews for 11,000 different consumer companies. I found that the average product review might be a little higher than you would expect. So 99.2% of consumer companies had product reviews that were higher than three out of five stars, and 81% had product reviews that were higher than four stars. When I saw this data, the next question I asked myself was whether certain products maybe were just reviewed lower than others, and certain products were reviewed higher than others. So I then separated the data uh, by primary category to see if uh, that was indeed true. Um, so in this chart here, each column represents a different primary category. So you see sports and outdoors, pet products, non-alcoholic beverages. Each dot represents a company. So all the product reviews are rolled up into that company and then we then look at their averages. So what we're looking at now is 11,000 different companies at once. Um, and the average product review for each of those categories is an orange. Uh, as you can see, it doesn't really differ uh, too much um, depending on the category. They're all pretty consistently around like 4.2, uh, give or take a little bit. If we go to the next slide here, it turns out that the average product rating didn't really have much of an impact on a company's revenue either, which I, again, found a bit um, surprising at first. So in this chart, I looked at the revenue of uh, companies, revenue predicted through Helio of companies that were in the top 20% of product reviews in blue uh, versus companies that were in the bottom 20% of product reviews in orange. And again, dividing it by uh, category to see if there was any difference. Um, not only is there not much difference uh, in the top and bottom 20% uh, uh, of product reviews, but in some cases, <laughs> products in the bottom 20% actually had slightly higher uh, revenues than products in the top 20%. So addition, uh, different, research has been done on this topic. And it turns out that a lot of customers, um, when they're shopping online, can actually be kind of weary if they see a product that has too many five-star reviews. Um, because they think that a lot of those five-star reviews, five reviews may be uh, fake. Um, so what is uh, important when a customer is shopping online is to see a bit of a distribution uh, in product reviews. So yeah, it's great to see a lot of five-star reviews, but a couple one-star reviews in there, a couple three-star reviews in there, can add a little bit of legitimacy and lead to a customer being more likely to purchase a product than if the product just had all five-star uh, reviews. Now, as a brand, this may be important because if you're doing promotions or giving away discounted products in return for reviews, it's worth thinking about whether a bunch of high product reviews are actually increasing your sales or not, 
or if they could give a negative impression to consumers that are shopping for your product um, online. So if we go to the next slide, this one I wanted to show mainly because it's about beer and microbreweries, which I think is always a uh, fun topic to research. But another cool thing about Helio is that we're able to see where companies are based and what their distribution is. Um, so in this analysis, I looked at where microbreweries had their headquarters. Um, and it's not really surprising looking at this that California leads. It has 520 uh, microbreweries. As a lot of you know, California also is home to around 40 million people. Um, so that's not entirely surprising. But I then ran this analysis again where I looked at the number of microbreweries per capita. And when I did that analysis, um, Vermont and Oregon uh, ended up being the leaders. All right, so moving on to the next slide. So how does all this help a brand? How does all this help you? We're going to get into this a bit, I imagine, in the Q&A, but let's think through a couple of the examples we just shared. So you can imagine if you're designing packaging for a new product, think through some of the uh, uh, new product model that Eric demoed. Knowing what the packaging of the overall category of your product looks like can help you sort of fine tune your label. So maybe you want something in some instances that reflects the average colors of the category, but in some instances you may want a a label that is different. Uh, maybe it has different colors or maybe it has uh, fewer colors. And something like the attribute data could come in handy when you're thinking about how to describe your brand and your content, your website, your social media, things like that. Uh, for example, if you're a fashion brand and you were uh, planning to talk about yourself as, let's say, vintage, uh, and then you see that the vintage attribute trends is kind of dying down, you may think about using different descriptions in your content. So review data can come in handy when you're comparing your product to your peers. Um, so maybe you're not doing as well as you thought you were on product reviews, but as we saw in that analysis, ultimately it might not matter that much depending on what your business goals are. Uh, with something like the microbrewery map, you can imagine that knowing the location of other companies in your category can be really helpful in trying to determine uh, where to open a new store or which stores to sell your products in. Um, so these are just a few use cases, but I think they really highlight the value of Helio data. And one thing that I find super exciting about Helio is that we're not limited to a particular data set uh, or a particular way of looking at the world. We can really ask whatever questions we want and then have the data uh, to help answer uh, those questions. Um, so that's kind of most of the use cases we wanted to show uh, you for the time being. Uh, before we get to the questions, I do want to say that we're constantly publishing content um, on our blog, so I would definitely encourage you to go uh, check out that blog, subscribe to it. Um, if you have any suggestions on additional types of research you would want to see there, uh, please go ahead uh, and let us know, and we can share a link to that blog after uh, the webinar today. So I will turn things back over to Alex, uh, who I think will get us started on the Q&A. Great, Will. Thanks so much to you both. Super interesting. So we've received quite a few questions, uh, most of them around how brands can leverage Helio and the data that comes through Helio uh, to help grow their brands. and. Um, over time. And so we'll go ahead and get started. And so Eric and, and Will, please feel free to, to jump in and um, answer. We, we want this to be interactive. So um, the first question, how often is your data collected and does it become stale? Yeah, I can speak to that. So we are constantly collecting data. Um, we we have schedulers, which basically, for a given data source, we will set a schedule to collect individual data points about individual companies. Um, these all get stored in a time series fashion. And so, the, you know, the first thing you, you should know is that we probably started collecting data actively, um, you know, in 2013 to 2014. And we've been collecting data ever since. So a lot of data points came, you know, from individual sources at that point in time when they were measured. Some of them we can back collect, meaning that 
um, maybe in 2015 we didn't collect data on this company from this source so we make a specific targeted data collection task to go back collect that data point if possible. Um, we are also evaluating whether data from the past um, or you know models even that we built on the data are still relevant. There are, uh, is such a thing as data drift and model drift. Um, as we continue to make Helio better and better, um, we are investing in a combination of basic infrastructure um, tasks, such as you know revamping the the structures that we're saving the data as and where, like uh, what sort of servers and all that. Um, but we're also um, revamping the sorts of models and the sorts of data that we're collecting and um, and the frequencies at which we're collecting data points. And uh, we are in parallel with evaluating new data sets, constantly revisiting old data sets to see if they're still driving model performance and benefiting us. So um, data collection is one of those things that, you know, we are hiring <laughs> additional people to help us with. We have um, a team of data engineers and full stack engineers who have capabilities of managing the website and the infrastructure that runs Helio and all the models that are run on top of the data. And uh, they are constantly busy maintaining that data and making sure it's fresh and relevant. Great, thanks so much, Eric. Next question. Are you charging companies and other people for Helio access? I'll take a uh, shot at that one. Um, so right now, Helio is an internal platform. So only the Circle Up um, team has access to the data. Uh, that being said, we'd love to be able to start sharing the data with members of the Circle Up community. And we've already put together data packets for various stakeholders and use cases. Um, for uh, members of the Circle Up community, I don't imagine that we would charge for that. Um, and if you're listening here and uh, think that their Helio would able, be able to provide some uh, interesting insights, some useful insights for you, please feel free to reach out to us and we will um, take a look and see how uh, feasible it would be to provide you with data. But um, no, we don't currently charge uh, people for Helio access. Great. Thank you, Will. Following question to that that just came in, will investors in the Circle Up ecosystem be able to leverage Helio Insights? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a I'll take a shot at that one. Um, I, I'm assuming the person who's submitting the question meant investors on the marketplace. Um, and if that's the case, I don't think there's, uh, at least to my knowledge, any uh, plans to currently uh, open up uh, Helio to uh, investors on the marketplace. Although again, we're sort of this is sort of like building the bicycle uh, as we ride it. Um, so as an investor. If you're interested in some of these insights and are engaged uh, on the marketplace, feel, please feel free to reach out to us and we will um, take a look at the use case and um, see what we could potentially do. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, Will, that um, as you know, we, we, um, we have a fund as well and investors into the fund would have access to the uh, Helio insights. Um, the fund was raised on the premise that we will be using Helio extensively and sourcing and diligencing the brands who we invest in. And so um, as the investors are, uh, you know, play a part in that, um, they will have the ability to ask questions to Helio and the analysts that, that work with Helio. Awesome, yeah, great point and good distinction, Eric. Great, thank you both. Next question, how does your data differ from other syndicated data sources? Yeah, I could talk a little bit to that. So I believe, and, um, and I think we have ample uh, evidence to back this up, that we're collecting um, simply more data than any individual um, company that specializes in a particular type of data, such as audience analysis, or, you know, for example, branding, um, or even, you know, product packaging, for example. Um, there are many individual data, uh, data providers and analysts that uh, collect, you know, limited scale data, such as, you know, um, surveys and focus groups. There are also companies that have um, 
data regarding sales that they receive either through partnerships with retailers um, or other mechanisms. And um, I will say that we have partnerships with many <laughs> of those data providers. And we, so there, therefore in those cases, we, we often have um, exclusive or um, premium access to all the data resources that are available through those individual data providers in addition to the data that we collect through our marketplace and through our relationships with our brands, in addition to all the public data that we are collecting um, that, again, um, if you invest the time and resources, sure, you can have access to as well. So what makes Helio unique in terms of actual data and the coverage is the sheer volume and the sheer diversity of the kinds of data. And those are the those are the two things we pride ourselves on. And and one thing that I can follow that up with is just that we've done some analysis on the importance of having that diverse amount of data for the model performance, um, models performances, and um, it is critical to have all of the data <laughs> for the models to achieve um, their high performance. Uh, any one source or any few sources would not be sufficient. And so one thing that gives us confidence that we have a uniquely valuable data set is that we've done this sort of analysis to evaluate what if we only partnered with so-and-so? What if we only were able to scale our operations to the likes of this other data provider? Um, that wouldn't be enough. And so that's what makes, in my opinion, um, Helios data unique. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that. I think one thing that's really exciting to me about Helios data um, is the fact that it's so actionable. So we have really powerful feedback loops uh, in place uh, between the engineering team and our data scientists and our other business units, our credit team, our marketplace team, and our fund team that are actually using Helio on a day-to-day -day basis. So they may come to Eric and say, hey, you know, this brand score was really useful for helping to identify um, mm -hmm. this company early on, which led to a great investment. This other score is maybe uh, not so useful. And the product team, the engineers, the data scientists can then take that feedback and use it to refine and improve the models. Um, and I think that's one thing that kind of differentiates us from other people uh, doing this kind of work. It's not just a bunch of engineers and data scientists in an ivory tower um, building something that may not be that useful. We see the use uh, and the utility of Helio data on literally a, every single day. Great. Next question. Do you give company names when you share data? So, so that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, it's an important question. Um, so just to kind of review what uh, Eric uh, touched on a little bit earlier. So we have three main buckets of data. Um, one is uh, public data, one is partnership data, and one is what we call our practitioner data, which comes from companies um, that we have uh, worked with. So if uh, it is data that comes from a company that we have worked with, that they raised on the marketplace, um, we would only ever use that data uh, in an aggregated, non-disclosable way internally to help improve our models in order to help us uh, assist more entrepreneurs. We would never disclose that data or the name of the companies associated with that data um, to other third parties uh, or the public. Um, if it is, say, a company that's Helio, uh, uh, a company that we've never worked with that one of our models put together say a brand score for um, we would probably take that on a case-by-case -case basis um, and we have in the past so we would look into uh, the pros and cons of uh, using a name uh, with uh, that type of information great thank you Will. next question what does helio actually look like and a follow-up to that what is the helio Output is it raw data or can it show trends and other analyses that you all talked about today? Mm, Eric, what does it look like? Do you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, I tend to have pretty like subdued black backgrounds to my uh, <laughs> Helio <laughs> interface. Um, no, but, but um, it's actually a really it's actually a really smart question because um, Helio, as I mentioned earlier, at its core, it's a set of data with models to sit on top of the data. Um, so as you can imagine, you could interact with Helio at the raw data level. You could interact with it um, at certain aggregate levels. There are, you know, um, 
at Circle Up, we will allow anyone at the company to interact with any individual piece of the Helio stack, right? The most common interactions with Helio exist through um, relational databases, right? So we have a database and everyone at the company can sort of query the database for a given brand and say, I'd like to know this about the brand. I'd like to know that, right? Um, and without giving away too much, um, we can evaluate certain things like how strong is the brand? Um, how strong is the distribution? How strong is the team? Um, what specific retailers uh, does this brand distribute in? Um, do we know their sales performance? Do we know their velocity, right? Um, these are the sorts of queries that you can make to Helio. Um, and so it, it looks like a result from a database. Um, of course, you know, so, sometimes it looks like the analyses that Will showed you. Sometimes it looks like the, the graphs that I presented, right? Um, of course, the most accessible form is a table that says for each brand a handful of useful information about that brand, right? What, what category is it in? Um, you know, how strong is its, is its team, brand, distribution, um, all the stuff that we've talked about publicly on some of the Helio blogs. Um, and then you can sort of dig deeper as needed. Yeah, and I, I would just add again um, to kind of echo uh, my point on like Helio data being actionable. Um, I think our data scientists and engineers, our product team has kind of gone out of their way to make sure that uh, everyone in the company can have easy access to Helio and have uh, made sure the data is in um, a format that can lend itself to easy uh, analysis. And that means that, you know, uh, an, associate, an associate on the fund team can easily uh, run a query and uh, ask a question without having to go to an engineer. So that's been really useful to have uh, the data in that easily accessible format. Yep. Great, thank you. Another question that just came in, back to, Eric, your presentation or, or your um, analysis of packaging, how many dimensions of packaging design are you measuring, including color, style, size, eco-friendliness, any others? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get into all the details. I, I could talk technical all day long. <laughs> I don't want to give away the store, though. So I'll tell you some of the things that I think about when I'm assessing a package. Um, and I'll, you know, I won't say whether or not and exactly how we're necessarily measuring that. Um, some of the things that I think about um, include some of the stuff I've talked about already. The, the colors, right? Um, the brand logo, the attributes, right? How does a brand market itself on the package, for example? What kind of keywords are they using? Um, Will did a, a, a little presentation on the attributes earlier. Um, you can see attributes on packages and you can use technology to extract text from the packages and then kind of perform analysis on, on that, right? Um, you can also look at the relative size of things on the packages, such as how large is the brand name, right? How, uh, how many words are used overall, right? Is it a wordy package, right? So any and all of these things um, are amenable to quantitative analysis. And the goal for the Helio model team is to, to perform those analyses uh, at scale on all the different packages and for all the different products, and then sort of see where the signal is, right? Um, what correlations do we find between some of those uh, attributes or dimensions and uh, success measures? And so there are lots of different dimensions. We're probably measuring some of those and, and incorporating them into our evaluative models, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that then people from the fund team or uh, any other team at Circle Up could then query from that database and, and know about a given category or industry or, or individual brand. Great, super interesting. Next question, can Helio tell me how my competitors perform compared to me and in different retailers and regions? Uh, yeah, I'll take a I'll take a stab at that one. So we do have data on um, distribution and sales of uh, products through different retailers. So this can be where a product is sold at, um, how much it's uh, selling for, um, 
so that information is available. Um, the details of this and how much uh, we could share, again, I think it's probably something we'd have to take on a case-by-case -case basis, but if the uh, person who submitted that question has a specific use case in mind, uh, please let us know. We'll take a look and um, do our best uh, to help you out with that. Great, great. Along those same lines, someone else asked about using Helio to help with pricing to ensure that they have competitive advantage when launching a product in a new retailer. Yeah, so that's an issue that we hear from a lot of brands that we work with, right? If you're rolling out a new product, you want to make sure that uh, you get the pricing right. That can be uh, really important, and if you are putting out a product that has a premium pricing, you want to make sure that you have enough justification uh, for that premium pricing. So data on pricing, um, again, is something that we, we have. Um, uh, and if you have a specific use case in mind, we will, we'll look at it and um, uh, see what we can do for you. Yeah, and I'll just mention that um, that does come up in evaluations um, and diligence conversations, uh, along with conversations about sale pricing and um, how often and, uh, and to what magnitude sales are utilized in marketing decisions, right? And so these are things that we think about and have begun to develop uh, systematic ways to assess. So definitely do follow up if you have, if you have questions about that. Great. Next question. Has Helio or CircleUp created its own categories, or is there an existing classification system that's used? The categories, is, is that, yeah. So there are many, many ways to categorize, uh, you know, anything, honestly. Uh, I actually studied, um, I actually studied categorization in graduate school, and so um, it's a, it's a tricky topic. I'm subject. learning something new today, too. <laughs> I did, yeah. I, I published very boring papers in cognitive psychology journals about all the idiosyncrasies <laughs> and ways to classify objects. Excellent. Um, so that's been a big challenge for Helio um, and for, for CircleUp, which is um, how do you know what is the right comparative set, right? You know, I sell a, um, a non-alcoholic beverage. You know, it's fizzy water with flavor, right? Who are my competitors? Do I compare myself to Coke? Um, do I compare myself to, to just the Perrier's and, um, you know, Topo Chico, that's a Texas one that I like to drink, right? Um, who is the relevant comparative set, right? And so we actually have multiple different taxonomies in operation within Helio at the moment. We have one that's used kind of overall in that table I, I uh, mentioned earlier that, that, that the business teams can query against that says kind of like, what's the general industry? And that's we, we, we put that together um, after a long and arduous process of sort of reconciling different retailer taxonomies and um, individual retailers and, um, you know, online distributors. Um, what are the sort of words that they use? What are the words that our teams within CircleUp like to think in terms of? Um, and so we've gone through many iterations for that overall taxonomy. But we also have a specific one for um, substitutable products. Um, so if I'm specifically looking at a product and I want to know who its comparative set is or who's in the comparative set, we have a separate model for that. So uh, what I will say without having to go into too much detail, because a lot of it's just kind of a, you know, you, you, gotta, you kind of do it on a case-by-case -case basis and see, is this working for me? And look at some examples. Um, and, uh, but I will say that we, we've we spent a lot of time doing it and we have multiple systems. Um, there isn't just one that works for every purpose. That's great. Thanks so much, Eric. As a quick follow-up, um, a question that just came in. As a, as a self-proclaimed categorization geek, have you ever read Oscar and Lucinda by P. Carey? Uh-oh. <laughs> no, but I will. <laughs> yeah, you had so much trouble now. You got some homework. Can, can, I, can I recommend some other obscure <laughs> titles? Um, Eric, we might have to connect you with this particular. <laughs> I would then. love that, actually. Yeah, let's, let's geek out. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, Great. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, you mentioned that you analyze a startup's team. How do you do that? Yeah, so um, there, uh, 
this is one of those kinds of questions that, again, I would like to just dive right into like how it's done and give you some of the details. Um, that's how I think, and that's that's how I communicate, and I enjoy that. I don't I don't have the license <laughs> to to reveal the inner workings of the other models. But again, I can tell you some ways that one might, <laughs> um, at a high level, kind of evaluate a team, right? And um, and and in all sincerity, some of the things that I'm saying here figure into the model. Some of them don't because they're difficult to measure, right? Um, but if you could think to yourself of different sources that collect a lot of information about people and where they work, right? Um, Circle Up has an incentive to work with those data sources, right? And so we likely have some of those variables that you might be able to find on your own, um, you know, navigating the internet for this kind of data. Um, and so the things that are relevant to a team are mostly kind of um, education, uh, prior experience, and then, you know, specifically prior experience in versus out of the industry, um, where industry, back to categorization, can be defined in a lot of different hierarchies, right? In, in CPG, uh, in beverage, right? Uh, you know, and so, so these are these are some of the ways that we can evaluate a team. Um, and actually, uh, we are probably going to be reevaluating team at some point in the near future as well. Um, so, you know, that model is evolving, but um, I hope that gives you somewhat of an answer without totally copying out. <laughs> Great. Next question. Do you visit stores to see the product in market or to obtain packaging samples? Yeah, I, we've talked about, um, let's put it this way. Think, think about all the different places that you can buy a Pepsi, right? It would be virtually impossible to ever collect all of those places. Right. Um, our goal is to collect as many as possible, as efficiently as possible, and um, at, and to focus on the data sources that carry the most weight in terms of assessing the viability of a product and the strength of a brand. Right. Um, and so we don't like walk into individual stores. Although uh, as a part of like our onboarding, I've heard from certain folks on the business team that they will do Whole Foods walkthroughs <laughs> to say, hey, look, uh, let's go down this aisle. I want to show you a dozen brands that we've worked with at Circle Up, right? Um, so we, we definitely take inspiration and go and, 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 and find products out there. One thing we do is we will surface new places to buy stuff to the data team and say, hey, have you ever thought about trying to obtain information about what products are distributed at this retailer or through this online marketplace, right? Um, and so that's one way to do it. And then the last thing I'll say, which is sort of silly, is that uh, I've definitely floated multiple times the idea of, uh, of buying, buying a fleet of drones to fly through Whole Foods <laughs> and take pictures of the aisles. I don't think that's legal. So um, we probably won't be doing that anytime soon. Uh, and, and that was me goofing it, it, off, but it's a it's, good question. It, yeah, it, it is a good question too, Eric, because if you think about like some of the work around um, the product model, like some of the stuff we're doing is comparing the colors of a particular label um, against an overall category. But it would also be interesting to see like a label compared to just the products that are around it on a shelf, which might yeah, not even yeah. be in the same category. Um, and I think that's one thing that's kind of um, come to the surface recently with the success of a lot of these like breakaway CPG brands. If you think of like Halo Top, like they had a certain label for a while. Um, I personally thought it was a fine label, um, but it kind of had a lot going on. It was a bit busy and didn't really effectively communicate their value proposition. When they redesigned their label, when they simplified it, uh, the sales skyrocketed. So it makes me think like it, it, is, it is not just looking at one product against the category, but thinking through like as a shopper going through um, an aisle, you know, what are you seeing uh, with the brief second that you look at ice cream and how will Halo Top catch your attention so that you buy Halo Top instead of Ben and Jerry's? Yeah, so, and just to geek out for one more second, um, I, you know, in cognitive psychology, there are theories um, about embodied cognition. That means that the way that you're thinking about something depends on kind of your physical state and, and where you are in the context, right? And I think you're completely on point by saying it will be essential at some point for Helio to incorporate the 
kind of contextual experience aspects of shopping for a product. Um, and that's definitely going to involve looking at a product in relation to everything else on the shelf around it, right? And so that's that's something on the horizon for Helio. Um, at the moment, the best way to look at packages is to download individual PNGs or <laughs> you know uh, PDFs from the internet. Um, but that will be a critical part of making Helio you know better and better. So your drone idea may not be so crazy after all. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not <laughs> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's only a little bit crazy and only in, in, in most and only in most ways. <laughs> Great. All right. We have time for maybe just one or two more questions. Um, can Helio identify what is driving sales for my brand today? Yeah, I think we could probably both try an answer at that question, but um I will discuss it first because well, I'm here. Um, <laughs> we we definitely we definitely think about that. What one thing that we're trying to get you know better clarity on is that question of what is causing the sales to go up, right? Um, you know, which is implied by the way that the question was phrased, right? Not just what's correlated with good sales, but what is causing the sales to go up, right? Um, the data scientist team, it, it, the data science team is actively uh, we're, we're hiring. Um, economists or data scientists with an e economics background who have experience in asking these kinds of questions, right? Um, distinguishing causation from correlation. And, and again, back to that uh, four stages from the Gartner chart, um, that's really kind of the, go the, the, the gold standard, the ideal state for any analytics organization, right? Is to know why something is the way it is, right? That's also the most challenging, right? Um, and so we have a really solid sense of what things are correlated with sales. And we have probably a half dozen different little projects at Circle Up right now that are attempting to get at the, what is causing sales to go up. And so maybe by the next time we have a webinar, I can actually answer your question. <laughs> but I will say that that is sort of, again, back to this chart, that is what we're aiming to do as a company. Um, and we'd like to be able to, to help you learn for example, for your product or for your competitors' products, what is driving sales? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a question we definitely think about a lot. I think one one of the challenges with this question is that there's not an easy answer, right? We wish it was as simple as like this X factor is driving sales, but what you see so many different times is it's like a confluence of factors, many different things happening at once. Some of those things that you you couldn't predict. Um, to go back to the Halo Top example, like a lot of their increase in sales was due to a package redesign, I think. Uh, but at the same time, they had this uh, uh, writer for GQ who went on what he called like the Halo Top yeah. diet, where he just ate Halo Top for like a month straight and then was still in super good shape afterwards. Uh, so it's like these, these different factors have a really interesting um, way of intersecting and kind of teasing out, you know, how many things can we predict? How many things can we actually analyze? And how uh, much of the success of a brand may be due to these more black swan events is definitely something um, we think about a lot. Great. Well, I think we're just about out of time. I know that there are still a couple of questions remaining and we're happy to follow up with answers on those. And we encourage and welcome everyone to continue sending questions to us as we continue to learn and discover new ways to use Helio and make it better in the future. So I'd just like to remind everyone, we will send out a recording of this webinar and we thank you all so much for joining and thank you to Will and Eric very, very much. Um, your insights are extremely interesting and we continue to look forward to learning more. Thanks. Thank you.